interesting. So I can't. I, I it's there you and go. Now it's recording. Life. <laughs> and we're live. Uh, welcome to SM. We're trying a new format. We don't know what we're doing. We didn't do any research. Uh, we, we just did it. We, we we've got a couple of pros here, and we'll do some introductions with all of our pros. Clearly, we are not the pros. We have pros and hoes. We'll let you decide who is who. Not. Uh, I'm hiding my hair. <laughs> I like it. Um, so we, uh, so we're trying out the Blab platform. If we could have some folks who are listening, please tweet out the link. Um, because the truth is that we had some technical difficulties with the other Blab platform, and we had to start a new one. We had to shut it down. Uh, how many girlfriends do like? Do it was I? It's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. How do we answer the question? It's Very careful. The answer. But it, there's a button, but then you I can't do anything. I don't know. Type as much okay. in the chat. So, so we're here. We're gonna we're welcoming everybody here. We have uh, Dr. Mike Seville and Noreen. We have Anne Marie, uh, Chris and Shy. We're briefly here for the pre-show. I see a lot of pictures, but I can't tell who everyone in these pictures are. Um, oh, Tom Cruise! Tom Cruise! I talked a lot about you with Andrew O'Brien. Uh, so very very excited to see you. And then Des and I were together. With Sam Mads, Greta, Mina, Katie Hardy, who's going to be on the show. Who else was there? I, like Richard Draper, McKeon. Richard McKeon. Who else? Leia. Leia. Draper. Oh, my gosh. Franklin. Leia. Franklin. Ponytail. Franklin. 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 Uh, like, I kept I one in ponytail, too. Benjamin Franklin was what kept going through my mind because of his ponytail. Carl Dunn. <laughs> somebody named Stan Lee. kept calling Stan Lee. Quentin, you've been so adorable on the Facebooks. Franklin Cook, that's his name. Proctology Frog. Oh, jeez. Proctology Frog. No. Chris Maxwell and Shy Lewis had to go get something to eat, Noreen. A little preview. March is Proctological Health Month. And, and, and none of this ends up really on the Twitter, which is unfortunate. And so if you guys, if people can occasionally check the Twitter... And let us know what's going on. We're dropping the hashtag in in this when you yeah. can. So, uh, we talked about butt sex in the pre-show. I don't know. We'll get around to it. Right. Right. No. Oh well. Yeah. We didn't actually. Yeah. No. We did. No. We did. Yeah. Wait. Okay. So we thought we would try blab. So we are recording this. So for everybody who does not know, this will be back on the YouTube channel. I am at Doc Foreman, um, licensed psychologist, ostensibly. Hopefully, still after the blab, we'll still be. I work for VA um, I in suicide prevention, uh, locally at the division level and temporarily at the national level. And also, we I do this with my great friends who also want to prevent suicide and make sure that frogs have healthy rectums. And, <laughs> and not in uh, Louisiana, like I usually am. I am here in Kansas because my man, Mr. Tony Woods, having a birthday. Happy birthday to me. Introduce yourself, Tony. I'm Tony Wood, Midwest Computer Solutions, and now Quantify, Quantify Corporation, Quantify.io. Which does what? Augments. <laughs> that is vague, but okay. <laughs> I like it. It's a software company. I don't want to bore everybody to death, but if you're interested, check it out. Quantify.io. Well, we're actually going to about something that you guys were working on because that was relevant. Oh, I oh, should yes. have prepared for this. Uh, sounds, I, sounds dark I, webby. Sounds dark webby. Doesn't it? I have been playing Space Invaders on my phone. You were doing that during your birthday phone call. With your and so right over here is one of my favorites. We have lots of people who've been co-hosts and Thanks, co-mods. But so we'll start with the top. Bart Andrews, where's Proctor Frog? Hey, well, he was uh, getting a little messy there, so I moved him off to the side so he can clean up, and then we'll we'll get back at it. Sometimes you got to clean out your frog. Uh, just kind of a general rule when you're doing a lot of frog proctologicing um, that sometimes you've got to clean up afterwards. Sometimes, Bart Andrews, amphibious proctologist. Sometimes yeah. poop love. It's just the whole proctology frog thing is just very concerning to me. I, 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 I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm here. Uh, we're blabbing, which is pretty exciting, yes, that's right? That's um, I, um, yeah, Thank we're going to change. We're switching gears. We're switching gears. And I love the dog. The puppy is adorable, Des. Um, this is 
the dog is so cute. Uh, so I'm glad we're blabbing. This was fun. I can't wait to talk about your guys' experience um, at the lived experience at NSPL. Uh, and um, that's really it for introductions. I think I'm, uh, I've introduced myself thoroughly and completely. Yes, and uh, Sevilla says he's going to do a shot every time that you mention parkology. Is it, like a, is it like a drinking game? Uh, SPS is favorite drinking game. Apparently, Have a shot every time. Every like time we talk about bottoms. Someone. Okay, so we have Dr. Bart Andrews, behavioral health uh, solution, not behavioral health solutions. It's behavioral health response. And then we have right below me, who is one of my meeting co compadres, uh, Miss Desiree Stage, Mrs. Desiree Stage. Ooh, aren't you? You are. I'm a missus. She don't care. She don't. It's true. I didn't we didn't you. change our names, but you know, we don't. We can't. Can't That's think of it that way. What am I be doing right now? Oh, I'm Des. Uh, I created LiveThroughThis.org, which is a series of portraits and stories of suicide attempt survivors nationwide. There are 135 of them as of right now. But as of next week, there will be. 145. Wow, that's a lot that are happening in a week. So, go, baby. Seattle. We're, we're going to talk about all the things that you were doing because we it. had a lot doing of things it. and people mentioned live through this a lot. That's very cool. And then our, our lab expert extraordinaire and yeah. favorite SPSM mom, uh, mom, mom. Uh, we have uh, Master Sean Erger. How are you, Sean? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to be here. NACON coming up. What's that? I do NACON. have NACON coming up. Are you going to be there, April? No, I'm going to be in D.C. that week. Oh, okay. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sean Erger. Stuck on social work. At Stuck on SW. I blog about social work. And I'm also behind the scenes, the secret agent mod of uh, SPSM chat. And I've blogged about Desiree Sage and lived experience and stuff like that. And I've learned a lot from folks with lived experience. So I'm really excited to hear about the conference. Uh, this was, it was very interesting. <laughs> And there, um, I will say that their experience about how social media is used relative to doing a steering committee, like we, we need to talk about this, like probably up the top before we start going into some of this. So one of the things that happened was we did, so we, we talk a lot about conference, but this isn't a conference, right? This was a steering committee and or an advisory committee meeting. So in some respects, it's a little bit more private. So Des was like, well, do we live tweet or not? And I said, well, we ask first. And we did ask because that's one of the things I do recommend that, I mean, you, you're a free citizen. You can create whatever media you want to create, but it's always kind to just sort of say, hey, is it all right if I do this? And so we did do that. And John Draper was like, sure, go ahead. And I said, do you have a hashtag? He said, whatever you want. Des and I have had, you know, sort of conference really quickly sidebar and we had a hashtag and we were ready to go. We were very nice live tweeters. And there were several people tweeting, um, just showing pictures and like, oh, look at these nice people here who want to do good. It, I mean, that was really the extent of the tweeting, I think, and then showing some of the cool slides they were showing and stuff like that. Right, Des? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we kind of slowed down uh, in the afternoons because that's when the ideas were kind of getting volleyed back and forth. And, right. instead of and, and I think that was sort of the facts. right thing to do. So. Um, and we'll talk about that because then there was, uh, so here's the thing about social media. It's a lot like speaking. If you are multilingual and the, and the people that you're with don't share your language, when you are talking in another language, sometimes people worry that you're being unkind. When you say that's a nice way to put it, which which has happened. I was behind some folks in a yep. Kmart once that thought I didn't speak Spanish. And la gringa lo sabe. <laughs> All I'm saying. So, right. So it does sometimes happen. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the things that was mentioned to you and I was that we needed to like, like by day two, because Sally Spencer came up to me 
and said, you know, Sally Spencer Thomas, like we, we probably need to let everyone know because the people who aren't tweeting, at, because we're all at a round table and some of us, like half our end of the table was tweeting like very fiercely, we got our computers out. We all were, women, like, all women, where were the male tweeters? Period. We have male tweeters. No, no. Look, I can't help you. We're just more technologically. Effed. And some people's gender isn't that binary. That's and that was particularly true of this particular group. I'm just saying. That's true. And it was like a everyone, lot of us and have I purple have hair. had that purple was hair. I'm no longer allowed to have purple hair, but I've had purple hair a couple of times. So I was like into it, right? And Chelsea, the anthropological quant qualitative mm -hmm. data analyst from SAMHSA, in here um so yep. so we had to talk a little bit and educate people about twitter and ground rules and so one of the things that we want uh want to make sure everybody understands is that if you are tweeting in a room like even if you have the right you know, like you can live tweet up a storm like when people get anxious if you want to be a good partner at the meeting then it's it's still important to address the people presence and let them know what you're doing and I, you know, and I think I made something like, I, I forget that you would not know that of course I would not tweet something that was embargoed. Of course I would not tweet something that was private. Of course I would not tweet something that you didn't work comfortable with. Of course, if something bothered you, I would be happy to take it down. Um, and you, but you would, you maybe, but some of these people knew us very well and mm -hmm. some of these people didn't. So that was just a moment, right, to share that. But, uh, you know, anxious. What'd you think about all that, Des? I mean, it seemed to go over relatively well. <laughs> I don't know that the people who I didn't feel like they were really concerned about us. Right, other that's than another. Maybe that's a that we generational thing, right? <laughs> when in fact we were paying very close attention. Like I right. was doing a ton of research. You know, we were talking about what they were doing and looking things up, and we were mm -hmm. very, very highly engaged. Yeah, and we were we were pulling people from outside in too, which I thought was. Really cool, and that yeah, happens at all the conferences. But you know, this is not really a conference; it's an advisory committee. So, and and it does. You, uh, what is Sean doing with this phone? Well, I was saying, I was, I was, I was pretending. I was pretending to be distracted. Be distracted. Oh, I oh. I was actually, like Tony. Like Tony. Tony's playing Space Invaders because it's his birthday. I was actually distracted. I'm sorry. Right, because he hears me talk all the time. So tell us, tell everybody a little bit. I was actually bit. checking out the Twitter stream, but. <laughs> that was a birthday bird. Oh. So tell us what the, what the uh, committee was about, Des. That was because a big table. I, <laughs> why do I have to do it? It was you clearly the, um, to have been there. <laughs> her mouth. So. Uh, it was a committee meeting for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, it, it was a subcommittee currently called the Consumer Survivor Subcommittee, which we wasted an hour yeah, talking Katie about. Katie was new renaming. to this whole mental health um, sort of um, <laughs> system. Katie and she was like, why are we talking about this so long? And I'm like, G generally, the more uncomfortable we are with something, the longer we spend renaming it. Thanks, Stu. Did, did you rename it? Did it get renamed? <laughs> no. Uh, it, I And, and nope. they're working on that still. So, <laughs> it was tabled. So, so the uh, issue is... What did you talk about for an hour, or did you come up with some good ideas? There was be, a lot of volleying. Uh, in terms of words that might have been used during said volley. Uh, some of the points that I made yes, were, consumer sucks, I don't want to be called a right? consumer okay. anymore. <laughs> and also, the way that it's phrased is consumer-survivor subcommittee. So I pointed out that not only does, not only do I not like the word consumer, but it also kind of implies that I may not be a survivor. Um, so I didn't love that, but there were there was a lot there. We talked about the history like, of the name, the maybe same because the for consistency sake, uh, so people could figure out what things were from time to time, right? Right. Um, 
So we did that for an hour, but the whole purpose of this meeting for two days was to kind of advise the lifeline on um, issues that survivors have, lost survivors, attempt survivors, lived experience. We were all a part of that. So I thought that was great. And I suggested that we just be the lived experience committee or something, which I think would contribute to this feeling of uh, community, which has been Someone tough. said oh, the customer service committee. Some people, some of it said the lived experience informed committee. It, the problem that my problem is that we, right. there was a moment where everybody loved the word consumer. And there was a moment when everyone loved the word client. And there's a moment where everyone loved the word asylum and where everyone loved the word patient. There's like, we've been like, we just do sort of disposable labels because I just, we get comfortable. Language matters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the language is constantly evolving. It's not, it's still not acceptable. <laughs> None of us really likes lived it's, experience. It doesn't, do we? it's, I, it's vague. Really vague. And the problem is that if you are if you are on the inside, you don't know what that means. So it's really, really hard to talk to people mm -hmm. who are not already members of the suicide prevention co uh, community. Well, it's slang. Right. It's really what it is. It's so slang. I'm like, those, can we just call it something where slang people know what that means? Well, it was interesting because I, I had that happen when I'm a, a part of a suicide prevention coalition in the county that I work in. And a few months ago, somebody came back from a conference and they were talking about this new thing called lived experience, you know, and I was like, oh, well, I, I kind of know that. <laughs> it's not really, not really a new thing, you know, but <laughs> I think it's, it's the idea, right, it's, it's just, I think the important thing is asking why is it relevant? How old is that label? Does anybody know? Three, four years. Four years? April things? But Maybe. I don't even feel like they were really using what attempt survivors that? before that long, before four years ago. I think they didn't say anything. I mean, when I started my project. Well, suicide attempters, if you look I in the literature, really suicide anything. attempters was, is used quite a bit, which is language I'm not. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not, not I with that. So I think one of the things that in learning and more about the language we use and how much it shapes cognition. So I, I think, you know, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about this, about how important language is. Is more conversation more important than choosing the right language? And I think sometimes we get bogged down in these. I mean, this, look what happens. Just a simple thing, naming this particular advisory group, an hour was spent, nobody could come to an agreement, which I think suggests uh, and confirms that we have huge, huge, uh, problems with our language around um, mental illness. There are many folks that don't even think mental illness is the right word. We're uncomfortable. Right? Like well, if we weren't uncomfortable, I don't think we'd have awkward words. I agree. Outside, I, I agree. Inside, any of this means all. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it creates challenges. Uh, nobody else does. But you know, no one's no one's coming forward with a great idea no. either. So we're it's like we're all just no. stumped. Um, yes, and so and so we spent some time being stumped. And I was like, wow, can we say suicide survivor? Yeah. Then, I, then that takes us back to the whole. Well, who is a suicide attempt survivor? I don't know. At least we sort of know what thing. that means. Yeah, I think people can kind of reason that out. Kind of. It's like we naming yourself. Are we naming ourselves really so other people know right what by the we time need we're done. can join in the conversation? I can tell you the IT industry doesn't care whether any normal people understand anything we say. So we, no we, we our labels are. Totally <laughs> um, you know. So, but I can tell you that it doesn't help normal people that we do that to you. Yeah, because the IT community is not trying to reach a broader audience with their communication, right? It's not that's not a goal no, of the IT community. Every it's person just, on the planet can use it and interact with the system every day for everything they do, but we label everything as if you know, as if you had like a introductory course to computer science. So like, well, how, did you re? Is your how? Did you disconnect all your peripherals? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does it mean anything? <laughs> <laughs> means nothing. Reboot. 
there is no boot. And if you have that, it suggests you have done it before and how it doesn't make any sense. See, I, I think there's, I think the important thing is that there's a process behind the, the language that really matters. Cause I no, I, I mean, I wrote an article called language matters. So not that I'm the foremost authority in that, this issue, we think but, you will. but, but in terms, thank you, Tony. Uh, but just the fact that, what you it's say that's... right now, no pressure. Okay. So there's content and there's process, right? On the surface, you have the, that's, the, that's what we see is the language and then the process behind it. So I think what matters the most is. A lot of words, but I don't understand them. I mean, I don't, it's nothing, I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm calling you out a little bit, but. Okay. I can talk to you about IT stuff for an hour and you guys would understand a word that I said. I, I right. can vouch for that. And okay. that's how we do business. So like, and, I, and I'm <laughs> telling you, you shouldn't do it that way because we enjoy it. But if you want the public to recognize what you're talking about, it doesn't work. So what I was trying to say, though, is I, I guess is that lived experience, when you try to look at, like, that, that's what we call it. But it seems like what you guys spent an hour about talking about is about the process and what it means after you make that label. And I think that that's the important thing. I think I think it really comes down mm -hmm. to a lot of the, the the power differential stuff as a as a as a provider as somebody that 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 provides mental health services. The, the language that I'm using to describe the person that I'm treating. So you're There's saying a process it's behind it. What's that? No, I, I think, I think you guys spent an hour maybe talking about it because you're worried that it might be demeaning. I, I was making a joke, but okay. uh, <laughs> I, I think we spent an hour trying to, to come up with a label because people have felt, um, have felt demeaned. Right. When they have, when people have meant to be demeaning, hmm. and it's like uh, we can't come up with a word that adequately uh, that adequately covers for the the word itself is not enough to cover for the fact that people have been demeaned and mistreated. Right. Well, I mean, one thing I notice is is, and I, I notice this frequently is, we even as as the experts in the field can't even commit oh, no. to not using the word commit. And I saw that, yeah. I saw that in that room and I was just like, and then, you know, someone was talking about some self injury and said self harm. So it's kind of like, how are we supposed to push this out if we can't? But I'm going to tell you like, and it's, if that's we can't like even really understand. tricky because that was another thing we've talked about with language is that that most of your language acquisitions happens during your school. We had people there at very for different ages. Early years of your professional like, training. So think of graduate school, the first couple of years in the field, and that your language tends to crystallize and not evolve after that. And so we have people at very different stages of language development. And, and I sort of fully expect when I'm in the home, I'll still be calling my patients custies. Brilliant really. linguist Dan Jurafsky's work. You guys want to look it up. I do want to say that the person who said I, commit was yeah, in Yeah, you're right. Now I'm that just I think gonna, of it, I'm there with you. No, and it's implicit. Look, I, I will literally be lecturing and talking and training people about not using commit, and people are nodding. We get it. You explain why we don't use it, how it's associated with all these other things, and then someone will raise their hand and start talking, and the word is used repeatedly, even though we just talked about it, because it's so ingrained in the culture, right? And I don't, I've made a decision. I made a decision. I'll talk about it. I'll let people know that you know this is helpful and that there's implicit bias in the in the phrase commit suicide. But after I've given my spiel, they keep using it. I don't word police them because that shuts down conversation, and then people are afraid to say anything. And the last thing we want is people stopping from communicating because they're afraid you're going to check every word they're saying. If you ever if you ever work with somebody that corrects everything that you say, um, it just shuts down the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Tony does it a little bit. He does sometimes. He does. He's he's a little bit of a control <laughs> freak. But but in a, in a good way, in a nurturing way, in a way that doesn't leave us scarred and bruised for life. Um, I understand. <laughs> I talk about it a 
about it independently too. I would never correct a someone lot. when they were a saying lot. it. I hear pretty often, pretty a lot. often. Even people um, that we I expect would yeah. know better. So I, I was doing a training on implicit bias and language and, and about person centered language, and I was talking with a psychiatrist. He's like, oh my God, we're person centered language is so important. We preach it to our staff. We live it. We breathe it. Another doc walks up, and this doc says to the new doc, "Hey, I heard you got a bunch of addicts in your emergency department last night." So here, here people. <laughs> so and it gets at this whole thing about people, uh, the difference between what we say we do and what we actually do, and and that's why when we look at why behavioral health is so jacked up, we have a lot of say this, do this, and yet we're we're not creating a context where the environment actually changes to support the change um, that we're looking for. That's the really big challenge is that it's really easy to tell folks do this, do that. It's another thing for people to do those things because there's so many other variables that are impacting um, their language choice. And they're not, here's the thing, people aren't consciously choosing these words, right? They're, these are, no. they're, they're not, it's, they're not consciously choosing commit suicide because right. they really want to, they want to shame um, people who with, with lived experience of suicide or suicide attempts history. It's implicit and it's, you know, the whole elephant and the, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the writer phenomenon, right? Right. Uh, um, and I, yep. go ahead, Sean. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to duck out and give somebody else a chance to, to talk, but I just wanted to kind of conclude about um, if they wanted to, uh, but just kind of conclude my thoughts about the, the language piece uh, and, and commit is that when, when I wrote that article with, with uh, Jonathan Singer about language and a lot of the feedback we got about the paragraph we wrote about commit, was and when I was when I talked to people about it, when they made the shift from commit to die by suicide, a lot of people said to us and to uh, to myself was like, "Wow, that just feels different." And I think that's the thing we need to kind of realize about language and this whole use of language uh, of lived experience is that you know going from patient to consumer feels different and going from consumer to whatever other alternatives i think it's just it, there's something about it that it changes the the relationship and changes the way that we think about it and that's yeah. kind of my two cents and yeah. i'm going to tell you that some people really like patient and they don't like consumer they're, because they want to recognize the fact that they are vulnerable and that yeah. i have a certain, that we have a certain kind of relationship yeah. well you're not buying chewing gum yeah I mean, it's a little bit mm. right. Sorry, and there's yes. also client. Client. Mm. client. Yeah. I, I I so here's the my client. Sorry, I'm gonna duck out. I'll let somebody else hop on, uh, but I'll, I'll talk okay. to you guys later. I think client is kinder. I think it's I much kinder. One of the interesting things about our language, oh. with, our language with when we provide services. One of the big things, I like customer, and I'll tell you why I like customer, even though a lot of people cringe when that. Customers suggest that the, the person who is the vendor needs the customer as much as the customer needs the vendor. And I think one of the things that's seriously missing from the treatment system is this notion that somehow the people we're serving need us more than we need them. And that creates a huge power differential and the sense of that we're the experts and we know everything and you're this, you're this person down here. When in fact, we're in the field, we're doing the things that we do because we need to do that. We have needs and we do this because we need the people to come see us and, and get services from us as much as we they need us to provide the service. And so that's one of the things about patient and, and, um, and client is it reinforces the power differential so much and it also completely discounts the need of the provider, that the provider doesn't have needs in the situation, when in fact, it's really clear the provider does have a, quite a bit of need in the situation, um, and those things need to be accounted for. Right, and it also allows the client or the patient to feel like they have power too, and to feel like they can advocate for themselves, because this is an industry as much as anything else is. And I wanna know that I'm choosing the best person for me. So why Which don't we worry about the term patient in, to learn. in the medical field? Like I'm my doctor's patient in the medical field. So why is the mental health field so different? Well, um, we're not strapping cancer patients no. down and giving them chemo no. against their will. So there's, you know, there, there's a, there's some differences in how we interact with people with mental mm -hmm. illnesses yeah. that are, that are quite so. So here's the other thing when, um, one the, of the, can refuse mental health treatment. 
Well, well, yeah, but you can't be forced to. You can't be forced to get cancer treatment. You can be forced to get mental health treatment. So you can be sometimes, actually. Yeah, they're under. under, under we're on. I don't. Maybe kids whose parents are refusing. I've never. Yeah. I've never heard of an adult. Okay. In, so, so what you're telling me is that the word patient isn't a problem. The problem is involuntary treatment. Well, the, the problem and is. If, well, all no, no, the, no. Pause well, yeah. for a minute. The word patient isn't a problem in a very, very similar close context. And we want parity with physical health care so badly. We want to be paid the same, but we don't want to use the word doctor and patient because somehow when it is your doctor and you are getting your, you know, ear, nose and throat looked at, patient is not demeaning, but somehow in mental health it is. And I'm going to say it may not be that the word patient is as demeaning as the fact that what we're doing in the mental health process might be demeaning. It might be that the words would be fine if we just behaved differently. I'm going to suggest that one of the reasons we can't pick a word is because there's something wrong, period. With the relation, the fundamental relationship between the, the patient and the clinician, what you're saying. I think it depends right, on which clinician, a, maybe. Right one, which right kind of clinician. World. I tend to... Well, I mean, I tend to have more issues with um, psychiatrists than I do huh. therapists, for instance. There's very much a, you are uh, below me. You don't know, you don't know your body. And it's like, no, I'm an expert. I know that I've been dealing with the medications I've been dealing with for three years. And if you put me on an antipsychotic right now, like you seem to want to, on our first meeting, it's going to mm -hmm. fuck me up. So let's not yep. do that. Yeah. Whereas with my therapist would ask me. That, that's a constant problem in you know, the technology industry where we can't listen to our, we can't listen to our, our clients, our, our consumers. We can't, we're not good at that either. We have a tendency yeah. to do what we want and leave I, guys with it. it and out. I think, what, I think what April's saying makes good sense. Uh, you know, trying to go about this, like the word's going to make a difference. The word won't make a damn bit of difference if the attitudes and the implicit bias that are attached to that and the culture around that doesn't change, right? So maybe it's not the word as much as it is all this other stuff that's around the words. I don't think, I think if you look at, if you look at, uh, Stu's who said's making a comment saying, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I do like a term that respects and reinforces that my therapist has some expertise that I don't have. So, and, and I will tell you that not all the people, and so in VA, we solve this really easily. We don't call them patients or we just call them veterans. And that's what we write in the clinical note, by the way. Um, so I have to remember to not, if to not for patient, customer, consumer, client, whatever, I have to remember to not say veteran when, the, when I'm outside of VA. But um, but some some people prefer to recognize you're an expert and want you to be that way, and some people don't. It's it's uh, if you're if you're good at your job, I think you try to find out what it is that they want from you. Yeah. And and then in the service of whatever their goal is, you sort of sort of step into the dynamic that's going to help help everybody get there. But it's but that's how do you come up with a damn word for that that ends up on a committee term? Yeah. Uh, right. Well, I feel like the fact that you're there at all implies that this person has expertise that you don't have. Um, but. I, I like to feel like so, I'm I think that's really more about also, how the person you know. behaves than it is about what you call. Like, and I can see the same problem. In that my, is true. I'm not arguing the same problem in my industry. And the best the consultants theory. have sympathy and empathy for their clients. The, the, the people who are not great don't. And that's the IT joke. All the IT jokes that you see in, in everywhere. Those are all basically based upon the standard profile of bad behavior that we all perpetrate at one time or another. Because we're tired of trying to set up your printer for you. Oh, and hey, Tom's the, trying to join. Can you let Tom? Do you see how to? You won't let you. I'm going to have you call, call back. If I ban him, will that? No, I don't think it works like that. I don't know, but it's I think after so. a certain point, it gets really hard to add people in Blab. I don't know what it is, but the longer you've been on Blab, the harder it seems to be to add people. I don't really something buggy. So, so we talked no. about several things. We were doing sort of review of the committee, and mm -hmm. we were talking about lived experience. And one of the things that sort of was the returning theme was when are we being unintentionally disrespectful to the people that we serve, right, Des? 
and there were sort of uh, there were sort of a lot of moments about that. Mm -hmm. There were. <laughs> okay. I'm not doing this. I'm not <laughs> sure what we're not doing, but I won't do it then. I don't know. Oh no, I was just thinking about Greta and how how it did feel like I mean specifically about trans issues it felt very much like someone would say something about trans issues and then it would be like okay but we have an agenda and it took it took a little bit of force to be like okay now we are having this conversation so um, there was a moment where Greta really was very it. very clear uh, I think this was sort of following a slide where they were reporting um, the gender of the people who were using the service and there were women men transgender, and then a fourth category that I don't remember because I sort of, what? Questioning. Yay. Questioning. I don't even so know what, what that So what happens means. is in chat, when, when you uh, start the chat, you also fill out a survey to get some demographics because they do some some uh, program evaluation of the lifeline, the chat, the, you know, which is good, which we want people to do. And so Greta began pointing out that if you were transgender, that that in fact, these options were actually not ones that you would probably select. And um, so so that was really good to know because there were, there were a couple of problems. So the one problem is that there weren't very many men selecting chat, so they're doing a service and we have folks who are men who really are at high risk for suicide and, and whether you are a uh, uh, transgender uh, man or you are like a cis man, uh, was not actually, I mean, clear, but we do know that both of those folks are at higher risk for suicide and that men don't tend to use chat. And then transgender folks have a really high suicide attempt rate and it wasn't, and, and, and it was not clear. And that was the other thing that I, I've been go, sort of trying to kind of not go round and round. That's not the right word, but sort of have an ongoing conversation with Dr. Ray Testa about, which is so like what actually would be the way that you would measure this? Because the whole point of that is to say, are our services targeting people at risk? Are we are we engaging the people that we intend to serve? And number one, we weren't asking the question in a culturally competent way. And I think Dr. Testa was, after a lot of conversation, even past the, the meeting with Dr. Testa, and he said, well, there were, you know, you sort of should ask two questions instead of one question, two questions, and that would pretty much solve a portion of the problems. And because some people are gender fluid uh, and it's more complicated, but that would probably come up and you could sort of know where to put them because that would be solidly in that, that group that has the high attempt rate, which is functionally what you're trying to measure. And I, and I think and Greta also pointed us to a methodology report mm -hmm. that said when trying to survey people accurately about gender, it was a 70 question questionnaire that I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I think it literally was 70 questions. And I was like, yeah. And it even says in the it even says in the methodology report, right. like you can't really actually use this because it's prohibitively long. And so the question this was a really actually I would love to talk about this more if Bart, you and Des and Tony want to weigh in. The question actually is, well, number one, considering how diverse people are. How do you, in the confines of a short uh, way of getting information, how do you get information about the people that you're serving that is still culturally competent, number one? I have recent experience with this. And, and then number two, like what is it you're really trying to answer? Because if we're really just trying to know gender to know gender, that's one thing. But if we're trying to know gender to just roughly know if we are penetrating a group that what group we penetrate? Ah, do shots, that's, another, that's another question. No. Uh, uh, who's gonna, no. Uh, we're uh, just going to... No. Okay, proceed. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, so, the, like, so are we... Exactly. So how do you identify <laughs> what your target service area or audience <laughs> is? Sorry. And then know, like... If they're out. Like, Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Tony Wood, you, sir... Yes. Let April talk. Okay, <laughs> April. He's under control. Thank you. I, I can't handle him by myself. <laughs> Nobody can. I, He's got a big lantern. No. It's a big lantern, and it's a two-person lantern. Plain and simple. No. 
two questions, which is what what is within the confines of chat or things like that, how do you do good demographic work that is still short enough that people who are in crisis or distress can fill out information about themselves? Or maybe we don't do it via survey. Maybe there's another way we do it. But like, how do you get information about the people that you're serving to let you know, like who your um, customer or service base is? And then, you know, number two, how do you sort of identify populations that are at risk that need your services and then like figure out if you are actually getting them. All right. Well, you definitely want gender and sexuality if you're trying to see uh, LGBT trans age group, possibly ethnicity. That's four questions. That's real quick. Those are check boxes. And then if you really want to accommodate the gender non-conforming people, you allow them to fill it in instead of giving them radio boxes. Yeah. I don't think that's very hard. That is very basic coding. That, it it turns out yeah. that if you'll just ask Rye Testa, he will send you his stuff. And it's like two questions with three different options. And it's really easy. Wow. And, you didn't just ask him. Like, we well, had like yeah. a day long. Well, no, I, I did actually. Because three weeks ago, while we were in the process of designing the the data collection tool. It was not this easy. I just emailed them and I said, uh, I I don't know what to do about this. And he said, well, you could try this, but this is 15 questions. And I said, I can't do that. I need something easy. And he said, oh, just do this and this. That's fine. And then it's easy. It's done. You just ask, yeah. ask where I. <laughs> it's solved. Well, I mean, it's really uh, interesting, but one of the things that happens, and people don't even realize this, on crisis lines, on telephone work, a lot of times the phone uh, the, the phone um, uh, worker, whatever term you want to use, clinician, volunteer, um, doesn't even ask the gender question. They, they, make, they make an assumption about gender, right? They make an assumption. So a lot of times the question isn't even getting asked. The person's making an assumption based on vocal tone, which is a horrible, horrible idea. Which also means that the, the that that um, that that um, clinician is making decisions at an implicit level about this person's gender that may or may not be accurate. So then, and I think Greta Greta's uh, Greta's training on this is so powerful. When one of the things that would have never occurred to me, given my experience, is that even asking someone their gender can create this tremendous load of negativity and 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 bring all this stuff up. And that would have never have, have occurred to me before. Um, I heard Greta explain that a couple of times. So that's really powerful. And so as we're redesigning our own crisis system, look at how we ask this question. One of the things is how you ask it. Um, two, don't make assumptions about gender. If you don't know, don't assume you know the gender. If, if we, we do it so, it's one of those things we do so unconsciously that it's hard to get people to stop, but it's something you've really got to be aware of. Um, and the other thing is you've got to give people the option to not, it's okay to not answer. And I think you, on that form, any form where you're asking, you have to give people the option. And if you don't want to tell us, then you don't have to tell us. That's okay. You've got to give permission to, well, to not make it. That... Sometimes you do need to know. You need to know. By the nature of your, what you're trying to find out. Well, an easy way an easy way to get around that is to ask them what yeah, their preferred pronoun that's is. Great. That's a great question. At the beginning. That's a good name, like, what's what's pronoun. You're calling somebody like Aiden Campbell on the phone who has uh, a, an ambiguous name. Uh, 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 you know, uh, I uh, was very clear that his, his gender is a little bit more complicated than in binary. Which I, I would, I think that's fair to say, mm -hmm. and uh, and has a male preferred pronoun, and but 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 it's just it's more complicated than that, right? And so and so the issue is um, it. If the purpose is to really categorize people's gender with some sort of high degree of granular definition, that's one thing. But what we already know enough about Aiden to just know what Aiden's risk factors are by just by virtue of saying that gender is really complex and fluid, that puts you in a group that has a nearly 50 50 shot of attempting suicide. That's enough for the. So if you go back to the how, like, what is gender, like, then we get, we sort of go down the rabbit hole. But if we say, well, if the purposes of the service, we just kind of generally need to know, are you in this group that's going to be high risk because your gender is not uh, like really cis and really like sort of mainstream normative? Rise's suggestion to us was very simple. 
ask for gender at birth and you have three choices. You have male, fake, female, and intersex. And if they and if they want to say more, they can say more in the next question. But they don't have to. Yeah. But then that gets you the but you get, gets you the demographic data that you need as a scientist to get the answer that you need. But then the rest of it they can either engage or not. Now, I don't know about a situation and how it works. What, what is the second question? Uh, let me. What is the second yeah. question? Because that question is not getting at the, the group yeah. at risk. You can go ahead, guys. I'm going to look it up. What else, are we, oh, what, what else do we want to talk about? about like, April? Program, like, okay, so my purpose about of talking the, about this number one is to talk about the fact that folks who are transgendered use actually use chat a lot. It's a it's a, it's a favored modality. Uh, they, we do need to know if we are finding and sure. serving them uh, because they are high risk of suicide and is a medium that if it if they're not enjoying this medium, if we're doing something that's making it not appropriate or not uh, not used by them then we are not really fulfilling our mission, right? Right, so. But if you ask only for gender at birth, you're not gonna, and if you only you're ask not gonna for know pronoun, if they're you're not trans. Gonna know. And if you ask if they're transgender. Right, what? and so I don't think, I'm saying to, to respect the person, for the person to feel that they're being respected instead of making assumptions. That's when you say, hey, what's your name and what's your preferred pronoun? Awesome. That's when you're talking to them. Before that, when you're gathering yeah. your data, I want to clarify because I, I think from a research perspective, risk categories are great things, but from an intervention perspective, I think they're absolutely useless and, and actually more problematic than they're worth. Knowing that someone is a so I don't I don't believe I think that there's a difference between signals and warning signs that suggest someone's at risk and categories. Those categories are statistical in nature. I'm not a if you are getting federal funding to serve folks, they're going to ask you to show some outcomes and they're going to ask you to do some program evaluation. So you're absolutely right. This is not in the service of the folks receiving an intervention. This is in the service of the researchers trying to provide information about the programming to Congress. Right. And that's what this conversation was about. So, so that's like, I think Bart's probably more clearly defined what the bind is for me. Like, cause I sort of have been, I, I think I've even said, I'm not even sure I'm ready to have an opinion yet. I feel like I want to ask a lot more questions. And I think Des and I have had this conversation a bunch. So if so, I think maybe Bart may be articulating it better than I've thought, which is that we're trying that we're, the information we're trying to get isn't the service of the person that we're, I mean, not directly in the service of the person we're responding to. It's in the service of getting data for the funders. Right. Yeah, it, it could depend on the person, you know, um, some of us are very uh, I, I think when you're a cis hetero person, your your gender and all your what you perform is just kind of natural to you. And when you uh, grow up as a queer or whatever, you know, I didn't feel comfortable in my body until I got a breast reduction, and then I could wear clothes that were a little more androgynous. So there's an evolution, and you kind of change and grow, and and so maybe maybe somebody who's trans wants to be recognized as such by the person they're talking to. Yeah, I think I think that I, for the first time, I feel like I, I feel like I've come to a sort of a peaceful moment with this where the issue is I don't have any conflict about knowing what to do to be respectful of how somebody wants to be talked to and and referred to like no conflict about that. And then it becomes complicated when you have to do the secondary thing that may or may not be harmonious with what the person needs in the moment of crisis. I found it. What is it? So. The context of this is critical. So what we asked Rye for was a simple way to sort this, but be respectful to people. But we couldn't be uh, we couldn't be thorough. We had to be, you know, we could only do so many questions in this context. So he gave me this too. Please indicate sex at birth. And at birth is in parenthesis. Male, female, intersex. Then the second question, which is the last one, please indicate gender, man, woman, trans. And then he made some suggestions about maybe replacing trans with a couple of different terms, depending upon what you figured out what you wanted to do. 
and he, he seemed to think that that will cover your demographic, that that'll basically cover your demographic definitions. But it's not completely respectful of everybody under every circumstance. I mean, he didn't. I don't want to. I would I like to know what Fredo not here. I wish, I wish he would come and sit I don't, in the seat. I don't want to suggest that Rye thinks that this is perfect under every yeah. situation because we asked him for just a very specific thing. So that's why I'm being very clear about what he gave us. Right. Are right. you kidding? We, did, we really we got, only 10, got minutes. 10 minutes. What else? 10 minutes. So. Uh, so that was something that I wanted to talk about more because I had been working on for the last couple of days, like trying to figure out a way to answer that. Um, we also spent some time talking, which I think is really important to SPSM, talking about how well chat worked, right? Uh, that was interesting to me. Yeah. Was there, but since we've only got 10 minutes, Des, were there things that you would prefer to talk about? Uh, no, I love talking about chat. One of the things I noticed, we were talking about Google One Box and how, you know, if you um, use a search term like, I want to kill myself or whatever, the first thing that will pop up is this this box. It says, do you need help? Call Lifeline. Uh, and one thing that I noticed was that there was no link to the chat. Uh, and I feel, and, and I brought this up in the meeting, I feel like that's going to cut your younger contingent out completely. Um I don't want to call anybody. I don't even want to call my mom half the time. Like I'm not going to call a stranger when I'm feeling suicidal, mm -hmm. but I might text them. <laughs> so if I have that option, uh, I would like to know that I have it. And and it's not something that um, even as they said in the meeting that they, uh, that they really push uh, or promote. So it, it would be really great for people to know that and they that, do in that Google have that box. service. You know, there are obviously services Which, out there. Hyperlink. Yeah, the Google One Box. You know, and that would be know, one of the things that they simple. pointed out was the their anxiety right. about being too successful in advertising text or chat. And I thought this was really important because they also explained why there were some limits. And I did not know. I did not. It's not that I didn't really know. It was that I just hadn't had like made, been that. They, no one had ever been that explicit with me before. Which is when they started doing crisis phone lines. They started doing the national suicide prevention phone lines. People had already locally established crisis phones in a lot of places. So it was the the basic parts of that infrastructure had already been built and they just had to kind of unify everyone together. But when it came, when it came to building a chat and text service for crisis, people didn't have the infrastructure built. And so one of the reasons, one of the things that's sort of a, a sort of a national crisis or an international crisis really is that people do prefer using chat and text and the infrastructure isn't built to serve people that way. And something to interject about the technology. I want to be clear that, that, that are, those original oh, crisis yeah. line people did not build that infrastructure either. That was built by at and They just bought it. So they didn't have to build the telephone yeah. network. They just had to have telephone. Well, this is very different. This is a very different, very different burden on these agencies. They have to become software developers and IT administrators. They have to employ people that have skills that they've mm -hmm. never that they've never interacted with before. It's very challenging. It, it's a it's a big challenge because NSPL has done a great job. Yeah. Suicide Life has done a great job marketing. It's beautiful, but the problem is even though there was this existing infrastructure, there's no mechanism to increase funding when call volume increases. And what we've seen in many parts of the country is that successful marketing has actually increased use of crisis lines and the crisis lines aren't getting any extra money to handle that increased value so even though the that infrastructure existed already now the the marketing campaign has been very successful and and it's outstripping um the actual resources that the crisis centers have there's no funding mechanism that says oh by the way if you get a 20 percent increase in calls you get this much more money it doesn't work that way um and i think that chat is in a similar boat and chat is a huge so if you, if you drive up the number of people using the service, which benefits people, you can't get extra funding? You, no, you don't get more money. So, so there, so, and, and Suicide Lifeline doesn't, yeah, Suicide Lifeline All does shots. not fund centers, right? It just provides a structure. So, so, and, and nor can they because it would, it would bankrupt them in a heartbeat. So you've got, and two, chat, there's several things. Chat is a lot longer. Like, okay, 
um, average phone call, you can resolve things quicker on phone. There's there's a there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details. Chats tend to go on a lot longer, so you need even more resources for chat. Too. And I don't know about the data, but the wait line, uh, the wait to get on chat is a lot longer than phone. You have to wait. A lot of times you just can't even get on, right? So um, there's a lot of challenges. So this, and April, you and I have talked about this. Like everybody, if everybody who was at risk of suicide reached out and got help right now, what the hell would we do, right? There aren't there aren't enough providers. So it's that, that balance of providing help and encouraging people to reach out knowing that there aren't enough resources. Suicide lifelines have been amazing, but they've ratcheted up demand and utilization and the money has gotten less. There's less money than, than there was before, not more. Um, and so those are those are challenges that we really have to get our, our arms around. That's why you're seeing places like Seven Cups of Tea, um, who are doing a very different model. Um, and and I and crisis text, but I and I, and I don't understand where crisis right. text money is Seven coming cups from. Seven, Seven Cups of Tea can run 550,000 chats a month, and the and the and the crisis chat can run 20,000 chats a month. Right. And that's what, you know, when they said they did mention this at the meeting, Bart, that the chats take longer. Uh, and when they said that, that resonated with me because when we when we did seven cups of tea on SPSM, I went and signed up to be a listener. I've had many conversations with um, people who are using the service at this point because I really like I've wanted to, to volunteer for crisis text line for a long time. And I don't I, I can't commit that amount of time because of my travel schedule. So it was great for me to go to seven cups of tea and feel like I can do this thing that I care about when I can. Um, but those I've chatted with people for two or three long, hours. Long time. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, it's really interesting. That's in Europe, commitment. there's a couple of crisis systems in Europe and their model is very different in the U S their model is you wait, you, you wait. And the clinician, whoever answers the call spends as much time as that person needs. It's all about meeting. It's, it's about the person who gets through, gets all the attention that they possibly need. And other folks, hey, if, if you can't wait, then you can't wait. You go to X, Y, and Z, whatever that happens to be. Where in the States, there's this press to answer, 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 answer. And it's all about turning them over and getting as many folks in. And we don't have the resources for it, right? So there's this constant dynamic between and fee for service. BHR has some fee for service contracts. Fee for service for crisis work. Imagine, imagine if police officers or fire departments only got paid when they went out, right? So it's like we wouldn't have any um, uh, police uh, departments or, or fire departments if it was fee for it's service. Very expensive, and only the wealthiest neighborhoods would happen. That's well put, Tony. And, and there are some places. Where fire, where fire departments don't exist except for when you pay them yeah. um, to respond, and that's precisely what happens. They, they, they don't serve anybody that doesn't have the money to pay them, which is, sounds really simple, but it has implications that are um, yeah. difficult because I guess, they'll keep yeah. the poor neighbor's house from burning down because they've paid. Um, so you'll have just your house burns down. I've, I've, got, <laughs> I've, got, I've got news for our conservative legislators that don't want to have a, a universal health care system. We already have rationed care in this country. So when you when you use rationed care bogeyman to freak us all out, please know that as far as behavior health care, behavior health care is rationed care at a horrendous level. Um, so let's uh, let's let's start talking facts uh, and, and quit with the bull crap. So universal health care for all. Woo! Well, so Des is letting us know that we have three minutes. We're going to do final thoughts and then there's like a stop button or I don't know. Erger left me. Oh, yeah. Pause, I guess. Erger left Just me. Uh, so er it's a hard G. I can't do it. Oh, he's calling Sean back has a hard G. Look, Sean's got a hard G and until you acknowledge his hard G, we're not going to continue. <laughs> So we're doing okay. okay, so we're we're gonna we're gonna pause the button just a minute, but we're gonna do last thoughts. At Doc Foreman, we've tried a new thing. We don't know how it's gonna work with the rest of our system. And I'm here with Tony, who said he's not even gonna help me. So my final thought is Tony fucking help me figure this out. I'm gonna be very emotionally supportive and say it's gonna be fine. Bart. What happened? What? Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, this was so much fun, and I loved your recap. Um, I wish it could have been at the at the advisory committee. That sounds like it was so much fun. It was actually. It was really intense. Sure. Yes. Final thoughts. 
It was really intense. Um, I had a good time depending on which part of the day it was. But I was glad that I was involved. <laughs> good, good job. Sean? Sean! Thanks for letting me hang out. This is great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't look like you talked us into something, naughty boy. That's all I'm going to say. Last, last, final thoughts. Erager talked us into this. Ah! Uh, Grr. 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 RG. Grr. Lots Grr. more happening. Hit us up on Facebook. Hit us up on Twitter. Ask us Grr. what happened. Um, we're we're trying to make the lifeline better for folks who have survived a suicide, either an attempt or the death of someone that they love. That's what we're trying to do. And he's gonna hit the pause. Bye, everybody.